want to take your Bibles this evening and turn to Proverbs 21. <clears throat> Before we begin, though, I want to remind you that today there were another three officers killed in the line of duty. And it just seems to me like this needs to end somewhere. But somewhere people need to learn that hating doesn't solve anything. And killing somebody doesn't create really a, a change in anything, at least not in that way. And I'm really soul sick about it, to tell you the truth. I love our country. And we, if, if we lose police protection in our country, well, all we have left is anarchy. And when you have anarchy, everybody left to do their own thing, then it becomes a very dangerous place to live. And I don't know about you, but I've got loved ones and I don't want to see face that. So we really need to begin to pray for our country and pray for our military men and women and pray for our policemen and women. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how a guy puts a pin on his, on his chest knowing that that pin that he puts on his chest may become a target for some idiot before he gets home that night. And then go out and defend people, the very people, some of them that are chanting and screaming to kill the police and pigs in a blanket and all that stuff. Uh, I am not a racist, but I, I don't understand this new racial movement that's going on in America. But I, I've seen it happen in days gone by. I remember riots and I think it was about 64, 65. Then riots again when Martin Luther King was, was killed. And what did it solve? If Martin Luther King were alive, he would be ashamed of what's taking place and the, the cause of supposedly racial uh, equality. Uh, I heard on Fox News today, one of the anchors, I, if I could have gotten my hands on him, I would have punched him in the mouth. I would have confessed it later, but I would have punched him in the mouth because um, Bobby Jindal, Jingle, Jindal, uh, the former governor of Louisiana was, was being interviewed, and he said people need to get this concept that all lives matter. And uh, Shepard Smith took him to task on that, saying, don't you know that's an affront to some people? I don't understand how anybody could say that saying all lives matter is, is an affront to some people, white, black, green, purple, or pink. All lives matter. doesn't matter what color your skin is. All lives matter, in my opinion, even the, the 57 million babies who have been killed in America, all lives matter. President Obama's life matters. I've heard people say in my presence, somebody ought to shoot him, somebody ought to kill him. I don't want that to happen to him. I want him to leave office very quickly and somebody get in that maybe can straighten some of the mess out. But I don't want anybody's life taken from them. Now, let me rephrase that. If they're convicted in a court of law and they're worthy of the capital punishment, I agree with capital punishment. I think you understand the difference. But I don't want to see people just shooting people because they don't like them. Uh, one of the chants that, I, and I'll, I'll brag on President Obama. Don't anybody pass out. He gave his response or gave his statement to the shooting today and for once he sided with the police and for once he never once mentioned gun control. Amen. It's amazing to me that we think that taking guns away from good guys is going to keep the bad guys from getting their guns. And if the bad guys have the guns and the good guys don't, who do you think is going to win the fight? The bad guys are. We're not going to have any way to defend ourselves. And the police can't always get there. We have a, a right by the Constitution of the United States to keep and bear arms. And I, I believe in that right. I've told you that numerous times. Uh, I carry a pistol from time to time. You won't know when I carry it. I don't tell people. I try not to show it. I wish there was a way I could carry it all the time and not have anybody know that I had it on. But if I'm not wearing something to cover it up, I very seldom carry a pistol. If you see me with my shirt tail out, sometimes it's because there's a pistol on my belt. But I am not your enemy, and I am not in any way a danger to you unless you pull a gun or a knife or you try to harm me and my family. Then you may see that I, I believe in the Second Amendment uh, to the Constitution to keep and bear arms for the right reasons. So I'm saying we really need to pray for our country. 
We really need to pray for our men and women in uniform, both in the service, the, the armed forces, and policemen and firemen and all the first responders. Can you imagine getting a call and going because a law is supposedly being broken and get there and have people shooting and killing you for no other reason than you're wearing a blue uniform? Does not, does not make sense to me. Uh, were the police officers white? I don't know. But anymore, it doesn't matter. The police, the, the, the policemen that were shot down in Dallas were picked, out, picked off out of a group of people, and they were shooting into a crowd that had black people all around the police officers. This, and, and this may make you mad, I'm sorry. This Black Lives Matter junk is just, in my opinion, junk. If they mattered that much, they'd try to stop the black-on-black -black killings in their own community. When it's 90-some percent of the, the, the blacks that die, die by the hands of other black people in their own community. Nobody throws a fit about the little girl I read about last week that was shot in a drive-by shooting by accident. Nobody yelled gun control and wanted to get the gun out of that punk's hand that, that drove by and made the, made the shot and killed her. And that happens all the time. Uh, I, I sound like a politician, and I don't mean to. I'm just really soul sick for our country. We're, we're believing the lie because it's been repeated so many times. If gun control worked, Chicago should have the lowest crime rate and the lowest murder rate in America. Washington, D.C. should have the lowest crime rate, rate, the lowest murder rate in America, and they don't. Now, I'm not advocating violence, but I am standing for self-defense because you're your first line of defense. If, I, if something happened to my house tonight and I called the police as soon as it began to happen, you know what's going to happen? It's going to be at least five minutes or more before a policeman gets there. And let me tell you a secret. In my house, I have a defense mechanism, and I'm going to use it while I'm waiting on the police. Not that I believe in violence, but I do believe in protecting and self-protection, self-defense. So with that said, <clears throat> got that off my chest, I feel a little better. Uh, I am so weary because of the loss of loved ones we've had in the last week or so. But one day soon we'll be together. The song we sang, uh, Victory in Jesus, my mansion's there. And it's prepared. There won't be any cop shootings there. won't be any assassinations there. We'll be together in heaven. So with all that off my chest, turn to Proverbs chapter 21, verse 4. Proverbs 21 and verse 4. We started this concept this morning, and we're going to continue it tonight. Here the word of God says in verse 4, it says, A high look and a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. I want to talk to you tonight about the folly of sin and pride. They go hand in hand almost all the time, and we mentioned some of this this morning about how when the fool says in his heart there is no God, he says that because he wants to continue in his sin. And when we as Christians decide that we're going to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we're going to obey and listen to, we become a party of the fool's folly, and we should not want to do that. But we're going, to, we're going to mention seven things to you tonight that has to do with pride. I'm going to try to remember to tell you big point number one, two, three, four, and five, so Isabel doesn't hit me after, after service and say, what was number four? I had 12. How many points did you have? If you get more than I do, it's simply because you put a sub point in there. I have, I have major points and sub points under them in my outlines. So tonight, let's have a word of prayer. Patrick, I want you to lead us in prayer, if you would, please, and remember our military and our first responders, if you would, and the families that lost loved ones today.
to appreciate the sacrifice and, and uh, the thread in which they operate each and every day. In the of the Lord. Father, we just uh, pray for the families that have lost officers in the most recent incident. We just ask that you continue to heal and strengthen them. Father, we pray that you'll encourage and strengthen the hearts of those in our own church families who have recently lost loved ones as well. Just give them the comfort and the peace that only you can. Father, we pray that as Christians that we would just humble ourselves to our knees, Father, and pray for the healing of this land, Father, that if enough of us would, we could turn the, the hearts of this country around. Father, we could solve anger with love, and these killings would stop. Now, Father, we just ask that you cause our hearts to be open our ears Amen. Let me ask one more prayer request for you. Carolyn has to have that procedure done tomorrow afternoon about noon uh, up at Chester County Hospital. They're going to cut her chest open and put a little bit of, they're calling it a, a loop recorder uh, in her chest and sew her back up. And then in a month or so, they cut her back open and take that out and get all the readings from it. They tell you how long it's going to be in? But the, the blood thinner they've got her on is causing hers to have some nosebleeds. She's had three already, two this morning. And so I dare not get her too misty or she blows her nose and has a nosebleed. But do pray for her tomorrow as she goes into that procedure. All right, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 4, we've already read. Big point number one is this, and it should go without saying, pride is hated by God. Uh, if you would read Isaiah chapter 14 and other passages where it talks about Satan, uh, you would find that his initial sin that brought he brought to the world and, and originated with him was a sin of pride. Uh, I want us to look at a number of, of verses, so you're really going to have to keep your Bibles open and your thumbs limb, limbered up. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 6 with me. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 19. And it says there, I'm sorry, it's verse 17. Verse 16, let's start there. I'll get it right sooner or later. So just get to Proverbs chapter 6, and then wherever I start, you start there also. Uh, verse 16 says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Now, we don't often think about things God hates. We think about God being a God of love. But if there's a God of love, he has to hate the opposite of the things that he loves. And that makes sense to me. And so here it says that these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination to him. Now, I'm not going to preach on this tonight, but when it says seven are abomination to him, that's a, a tool uh, that the Hebrew poets use to draw attention to the seventh thing in the list. But we're just going to look at the first one. In verse 17, it says, God hates a proud look. So the very first thing that we can mention about pride is that God hates pride. Psalm 119 and verse 21 says it this way. Should I wait for you to get there? Or are you just going to write it down? Psalm 119 verse 21 says, Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. When we uh, talked about Psalm 14 verse 1 this morning, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. He turned, if you read the prior verses, he turned away from God. He did not want to exalt God. He wanted his own way, and he was setting himself up as the right uh, and, and the only one who has the, the right to decide what's right and what's wrong. And as we've mentioned numbers of times, that's exactly where we are in our society. And the sad thing is that's where we're getting to in our churches. I noticed this past weekend uh, probably Friday that happened, it was in the news this weekend, that the Methodist Church, and I'm not sure which branch of it, but the Methodist Church uh, has ordained a, a, a lesbian um, uh, bishop. Now, I don't know how they do that and stay in sync with the Bible. First of all, uh, a pastor, according to the Word of God, should be a man, shouldn't be a woman. Now, that's not a, a slam against women, it's just that that's God's plan, that's God's order, so we accept that. So first of all, just being a woman would put her outside of the will of God in, in what the Bible says. And then to put somebody in a position of leadership and authority in a church that the Bible says is an abomination that is involved in sin that's abomination. I don't know how they rectify that except to say they don't care what God says anymore. 
And we're seeing that more and more in all different stripes of churches. Baptist churches are ordaining women now. Uh, some Baptist churches have gone astray on a number of other things, and some of them have uh, left the, the Southern Baptist Convention over the very thing of ordaining women into the ministry. And so we see that people don't want to listen to what God says. They have erred from the commandments of God, and it's because of pride. When we disobey God, it's because of pride. When the prodigal son left home, thought he could do it on his own, I like to put it this way, he had a plan. But his plan was his plan, not the father's plan. He erred in pride, thinking he knew more than his father did. We do the same thing as Christians when we think we know more than our heavenly father about whatever the Bible tells us. Wouldn't it be great if every Christian in our church, every believer that comes to Safe Harbor Baptist Church, would just make that commitment? Whatever the Bible says, that's it. I'm not going to argue with it. I'm going to obey it. And they did. What a difference would it make in our community? What a difference would it make in the home life of our, uh, our own church family? And what a difference it would even make in the church functions here at Safe Harbor Baptist Church. I don't know how many of you hear about things that take place, but right now going on in Burlington, North Carolina, there has been a great revival going on there. They've had a, a, a tent pitched, a huge tent, like a circus tent, and for the past 10 weeks, there have been hundreds of people getting saved in that tent. Now, they're not getting saved because of a Baptist church or a church. They're getting saved because the preaching of the Word of God is straight down the line and straight from the King James Bible. And sometimes we want to err from that. We, we have a guy here every year that pitches a tent. Every year he tries to get our church involved with it, but I can't get involved with him, not necessarily because of what he preaches or teaches, but because of what the other people that are involved in the thing preach and teach. But the truth is God's word can still bring revival. God's word can bring an awakening to America if we would make that commitment to obey it, whatever it says, obey it. Uh, I don't have a right. I've been through five and a half years of Bible college. I teach in a Bible college. I do not have the right to change the Word of God. I would like to think I know a little more about it than some of the students that walk in as freshmen in our Bible college. I would like to think I have a little more experience and a little more knowledge and a little more learning about the Word of God. I can't use that as an excuse and change one jot or one tittle of the Word of God. I have to leave it exactly like it is and preach it exactly like it is. And if we would take that, we would come to the conclusion that our lives can be better than they are. We've already mentioned our text verse, Proverbs 21.4, a high look and a proud heart and a plowing of the wicked is sin. Well, what's a high look? Snooty. Hold your nose up in the air and kind of look down on everybody else and say, if you were as good as I am, you'd be all right. Well, thank God I'm not like those people. I heard somebody just recently call some, some, a group of people snobby. I said, well, I hope they didn't cause you any trouble. The person said, no, they didn't. Don't let snooty people, proud people who look down on everybody, give you any source of trouble or conflict whatsoever. You do what's right. You live according to the word of God and somebody else that's walking down the road with their nose up in the air looking down at you, you just remind them that you belong to your heavenly father. You don't answer to them. But then be careful that you do answer to your heavenly father. See, there's a kicker. We don't want those people looking down on us and quote unquote judging us. We want to do it our way, but we ought to be doing it God's way and then they wouldn't have any reason to look down on us. Number two, big number two, is found in Job chapter 35, verses 12 and 13. And the number two states it this way, Isabel, pride merits no divine response. When you get proud with God and you start demanding things out of your pride-filled attitude, don't expect a response from God. Well, God, you know what a good Christian I am. You ought to bless me with thus and thus. Don't expect a response from God when you're praying like that. In Job, it says this way. Uh, it says, There they cry, but none giveth answer, because of the pride of evil men. God will not hear vanity, neither will the Almighty regard it. We have no reason to expect God 
to answer our prayer when we come in a spirit of pride demanding God do something for us simply because we want it done. Does that make sense? How do you handle your children? How do, how do you handle your children? Daddy, I want a brand new bike and you got to get it for me. And what do you say to your child? You just wait on it. And my mom and dad used to say, well, want in one hand, shell corn in the other, see which one gets full the fastest. I tried it a couple times, and shelling the corn always got, got filled faster than the wanting. It doesn't do any good to demand things from your parents. It doesn't do any good to demand things with a spirit of pride from God either. He will not hear you. In Jeremiah 13, 17, it says this, God will not hear vanity. Uh, I'm sorry. My soul shall weep in the secret places for your pride. God cries over his children when we have a spirit of pride, when we think we're better than other people. He cries over that response. He cries over that desire that we have to lift ourselves up in pride. You know, here's, here's the truth. We, we have too many Christians that are criticizing other people just to make themselves feel better and thinking they make themselves look better. But you know the truth is, how do you feel about it when you hear somebody constantly critical about everybody that, that they talk to you about? How do you feel about that? Now, before you answer, I know that there are some Christians that revel in it. They like that gossip stuff. They like that. But let me remind you that that one who's gossiping about somebody else to you probably is gossiping about you to somebody else. So if they're critical about them, they're probably critical about you. So now how do you feel about that person? If they're running them down, they're probably running you down sooner or later. Don't expect it to bring about what you want it to have. God says he weeps for our pride. Big number three is pride results in derision. Now what does derision mean? That means a confusion and separation and people wandering around and not knowing exactly what's going on. In Psalm 10 and verse two, it says the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Now, I don't mean to make anybody mad. The Black Lives Movement hands up, don't shoot, black live movement is an example of pride. Black lives matter is an example of pride. Of course black lives matter, but so do white lives, and so do brown lives, and so do yellow skinned lives, and so do the unborn lives, so do the police lives, and the firemen's lives, and, and the, the uh, military people's lives. All lives matter. And what makes us, if, if, if you were to stand out in the street and start yelling and holding signs saying white lives matter, what would they call you? they call you a racist. But we don't dare say that in reverse because they're the ones who are making the, the, the challenge to, to us. And yet the truth is all lives matter to God. Jesus died for the world. He didn't die for white people. He didn't just die for Americans. He died for the black men in Africa. He died for the, the white men up in Russia. He died for the, the yellow-skinned Chinese over in China and Japan. He died for everybody. So when we are persecuting someone else, the verse says the poor, but you could put probably anything in there and be the same thing. We're going to persecute somebody simply because they're different than we are? Mm-mm. -mm. I'd have to persecute everybody in the world because thank God there's only one Gary Gilbert. Amen? I got a couple of amens about that. Fran, you watch it now. We're all different. We're all different. Uh, everybody looks at, at dude. I had some folks tell me when they first saw dude, uh, they said, he looks just like you. I said, well, that's a miracle because there's no blood there. <laughs> Rebecca's adopted. So I don't know how he would look just like me unless it was just by happenstance and God wouldn't, wouldn't put that on a poor baby boy, would he? But the truth is, we're all different. All of us. Some of us have gray hair. It's turned gray like me and Pat. And some of us have turned loose hair. I won't mention who those people are. But we're all different. Some of us have big noses. Some of us have big bellies. Like I told you this morning, chubby fingers matches the rest of me. We're all different. So who are we going to persecute? Are you going to persecute the, the blue-eyed, uh, blonde-haired girls or guys? Well, why? Simply because their hair is a different color? Well, I'd never do that. Then why would you persecute somebody that has different skin than you do? 
Or why would you persecute somebody that has a different opinion than you do? They're allowed their opinion. Leave them alone. Don't even have to convince them they're wrong. One day they'll find it out. We had some folks in church this morning that admitted that they weren't saved, weren't on their way to heaven, were, were choosing by their not trusting Christ, were this morning choosing hell. Well, what, what can I do? I could logically talk them into something maybe, but if I logically talk them into it, somebody else will logically talk them out of it later on. So we preach the gospel and we pray for them. When they went out the door, the one young man, I said to him, I looked him right in the eye and said, if you need to talk, you know where I'm at. Why don't I twist his arm, try to make him get saved? What would that do? Might hard him, he may never get saved. So we leave the door open. Why would we have this idea of pride making us the, that one that causes derision or causes separation? Uh, in Luke chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, He hath showed strength with his arm. He bathed his, um, he hath scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. God causes derision where there's pride. Uh, who can give me an example out of the Old Testament? where God saw a man lifting himself up in pride, saying, we're going to get to heaven. What was it? Babel. Tower of Babel. Babel. He says, you think you are? Watch this. And suddenly none of them understood each other. And the ones that could understand each other got in little groups and they disbanded and went to different places. He said, you're, you're not in control as much as you think you are. So we should, not under, we should never have pride because it leads to derision. Number four, pride and destruction go together. Job 26, 12 says this, By his understanding he smiteth through the proud. What's it mean? It means God's going to take care of it. God's going to take care of it. Uh, there are people that talk about you, criticize you, and run you down for a number of things. Don't worry about them. When we have people that don't like us and want to do us harm and are mean and cruel to us, don't worry about them. Why? Because God's able to take care of it. The Bible still says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And I constantly tell folks, when God repays somebody, he does a whole lot better job of it than I do. I just make people mad. But when God takes care of the situation, he can control it. So we need to understand that he has destruction that comes because of proud. In so I'm sorry, Proverbs 15, 25, it says, The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. Those people that look down their nose at you and they want to judge you or condemn you or make fun of you or hurt you, you let God take care of them because God says, I'll destroy their house. I'll take care of them. Now here's the kicker. If you're living like you should as a Christian, when they want to hurt you or run you down or destroy you or harm you, what should you do about it? That's right. Love them and pray for them. Does not the Bible say, love thy neighbor as thyself? Doesn't it say, pray for your enemies? Then why are we so quick to get mad? Take offense. The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You love the way of God, you won't be offended by everything that comes down the pike. I have people try to say things to me and do things to me to offend me. I know it. Uh, just recently, uh, I'm not going to say any names, but just recently I had uh, a gentleman while I was preaching shake his head, give him a roll of the eyes, and give me a dirty look, and then got up and walked out of where I was preaching. That didn't bother me. Why? Because I was telling the truth. He needed to hear the truth, but he didn't want to hear the truth. I've been preaching. I preached at a funeral one time down in Northeast, close to Northeast. Uh, um, what's the guy's name? Frank Bowman. Frank Bowman's son died, and he was, I think, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, one of the two. And so when, when we went to the funeral, we weren't supposed to have it. They were supposed to have it, but Pastor Cunningham and I went to the funeral, and just as we walked in the door, Frank comes up to us and said, I'd like for you to say a few words during the service if you would. And so those Jehovah's Witnesses presented their whole thing. And Pastor Cunningham got up, he said a few words, and I got up and said a few words, except my few words were from the Word of God, and it was how to be saved. If I could have died because of the way somebody looked at me that day, I'd be dead. But you know what? It didn't matter. They needed to hear the truth. 
They had heard all the lies from their propaganda, from their leaders. They needed to hear the truth from the word of God. How much plainer can it be when Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life? He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth on me shall never die. Believest thou this? And I preached about a five-minute message on that one verse or two verses, whatever it happens to be. But the truth is, we don't worry about people that are out to hurt us. God will take care of that. God will bring destruction if necessary. That destruction may bring them to their knees and help them come to know him. Number five, are you with me, Isabel? Yes. Good. Number five, pride braids contention. Proverbs 13.10 says, only by pride cometh contention. Now, what is contention? Well, you say something, somebody else jumps down your throat about it. Suddenly you got a little argument, a little row going on. That's because of pride. You know, Proverbs 15, 1 says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, and grievous words stir up anger. So if you want to really get somebody, when they're getting all mad and angry, you just keep a sweet spirit. Either just keep quiet and don't say anything, or whatever you do, say sweet things. You, you want to really win the argument. Winning the argument doesn't mean that you always get the last word in. Winning the argument is, means that you do what God says to do in the proper way in the situation. It brings contention. He that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. That's Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 25. Did you hear it? Now listen. Carolyn Polk Ryan, make sure he hears this. Becky Polk Becca, hope, make sure she hears this. Becky, you poke mama, make sure she hears this. Here's what it says again. I'm going to read it. It says, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife. What's that mean? Have you ever been around anybody that almost everything they say is an argument? Or everything you say becomes an argument when you never intended it to be an argument? You can say the sky's blue and they'll say, well, unless it's going to rain the next morning, then it's red. Is that right? Red in the morning, sailors take warning. Oh, no. It, unless it's red in the morning, then it's, it, it, yeah, you know what I'm saying. You can tell them grass is green. They'll say, well, not that Bermuda grass stuff that comes in almost white looking before it turns green. You can say roses are red. They'll say, well, not all of them. Don't you hate to be around people like that? Everything's, I hate having to walk on eggs around people. Just being so careful of what you say because they're going to take offense or they're going to yell at you, they're going to fuss at you. No, that's pride on their part. You know, I don't, I, I've had people say dirty words and cuss words in front of me and I don't even jump down their throat about it. Why? Because it's none of my business. That's their business. Now, if they take the Lord's name in vain, I may say something smart like, oh, you know my Savior? Oh, you know my Heavenly Father? Just to let them know that what they're talking about is somebody that's personal to me. Not my job to condemn and, cor and correct everybody that comes along. Not my job at all. God will take care of that through the Holy Spirit. Pride brings contention, arguments. And then in James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. So when you have those people that are always starting an argument of one type or another with you, just leave them to the Lord. How, how many times have I said that in this message already? Just let God take care of it, just leave them to the Lord? That's what we have to do. Number six, pride brings judgment. In Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 19, it says, And I will break the pride of your power, and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. For thy days, this is Jeremiah 50, 50 verse 31, For thy day has come, the time that I will visit thee. You know, there is a payday someday. One of these days I'm going to preach that message. I'd have to preach it like he did or take his outline because nobody has ever done it like he did. But R.G. Lee had an outline on Jabez and um, uh, Jezebel. I'm sorry, Ahab and Jezebel. And it was called Payday Someday. And they thought they were getting away with things all their life, but there was a payday coming. And the judgment day is coming for everybody. You say, I'm a Christian, I won't be judged. No, you'll stand before the beam of seat of Christ and you'll be judged according to the opportunities that you missed to serve God and the good things you could have done and didn't and the rewards that you could have had and didn't get or the rewards that you got because of what you did right. 
the Bema Seat of Christ is the judgment seat that we'll face. And if you're without Christ, you'll face the great white throne of judgment where there's no hope because it's really not a judgment seat. It's a passing the final verdict seat. So pride earns judgment. Number what? Number seven. I'm glad you're there right with me. Pride is associated with shame and bondage. Here's, here's the things I've never understood. I, a lot of things I don't understand, but one thing I've never understood, how people can be so stupid and never experience any shame about it. They can act so shameful and never experience shame. They can do things that they know are wrong and never have one, one iota of shame about it. The only explanation I can have for that is they know nothing about our Heavenly Father or the Word of God. I, I, tell, I tell folks, I'm honest, I still sin. Anybody else here still sin? But you know the difference is? I feel shame when I sin. And I don't want to sin. And I try to give my sin immediately when I realize I've sinned. I try to confess it and get rid of it so I won't have to have uh, that, that, that conviction on my heart. And people, it seems like even Christians can live in sin and walk in sin and do things they know are wrong. And they're never shamed about it. Never shamed about it. We have a society where there is no sin, and I guess that's why. We have a society when all the, the, the rights and wrongs have been cast aside, and it's whatever man wants to say is right and wrong, and that's what they've decided to do. But sin is shameful, and sin brings bondage. Pride comes with shame. Pride brings about bondage. In the book of Job, verse, uh, chapter 40, verses 11 and 12, it says, Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold, every one that is proud and abase him. Uh, look on every one that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Uh, in chapter 11 and verse 2 of Proverbs, it says, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. In chapter 29 and verse 33 of Proverbs, it says, A man's pride shall bring him low. How many times have we seen that? History repeats itself. How many times in history has there been a leader of a country that was the power of the known world at the time? And in their pride, they overlooked small faults in their defense systems. And in their pride, they ended up being overthrown. They had the ability to do much greater than they did, but their pride said, no, you're okay. You, you've got your defenses all ducks in a row. Uh, it often happens that way. What's the matter with America today? Pride. We don't answer to anybody. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I've got my plan. I've got it all figured out. I know more about what I'm going to do and what I know to do and what I want to do than anybody, so leave me alone. And it's killing our nation. I've been telling our young people for a long time, our girls, I said, don't you, don't you marry some guy that doesn't have a few calluses on his hands. Most of our young men have calluses on their thumbs where they sit and play video games to the point that they don't know anything else to do but play video games. Put a shovel in their hand, they're not even sure how it works. Put an old-fashioned lawnmower, what we call an Amish mower, in their hands, and they look at you like, I'm not going to use that thing to cut grass. Well, hey, I used to earn... $3 a lawn cutting grasses all around our neighborhood. My dad felt so sorry for me, he went out and bought our first powered lawnmower, gas-powered lawnmower. Wasn't anything fancy, didn't have adjustable wheels, had one wheel setting, that was it. You pulled a cord, it might start. First time I used it on our lawn, I threw a rock through the siding of the house. My dad come out the front door and looked at that side. He said, don't you think you ought to walk around the yard and pick up the rocks before you try to cut the grass? I said, yeah, that'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? I learned to agree with him quickly, else you're going to have a problem. <laughs> dad was saying something. He was saying, you're in trouble if you don't pick the rest of the rocks up here before you cut the grass. But I'm saying we, we need some people that, that understand that shame comes when we're proud and we think we're too good. And we think nobody else has a right to tell us what to do. 
you know, we, we, we're in trouble in America, and it's because of pride. Pride brings hatred between people. We look down our nose at other people. Pride causes all the problems we've talked about and probably a thousand more. Do we have any right to be proud? Are you proud of your family? I'm proud of little dude, but you know how I'm proud of little dude? Thank you, Lord, for giving me a blessing like that in my old age. He, I, you know, when we, when we adopted Rebecca, I was uh, 50, 45 years old, right? I was old enough, yeah, I was. 22 years from 67 years is 45 years, right? Don't rub it in. I was 45 years old when we adopted Rebecca, right? Okay, 45 years ago, I was old enough to be her grandfather already. And here we have a brand new baby in the house. And she was such a good baby, we always bragged on her. She's an old folks baby. Slept the night through, didn't we, didn't we, Ruth? Yeah. Slept the night through, never gave us any trouble. And then, then we went on vacation to Williamsburg one time, and she started teething, gave us fits the whole time we were down there. Had to get a little cowbell and hang it over her car seat so she'd shut up crying. But basically, just a great baby. And I thought, man, that was good. Then when little dude was born, I'm thinking, oh, man, can I do this again? He's better than she ever thought about being. He never fusses. Three times he fusses. When he's hungry, when he's tired, when he's changed. And that's it. That's it. He never cries. Sometimes you'll wake up and he'll fuss a little bit, but he never sheds tears. He never squalls and screams and hollers. How many of your kids squalled and screamed and hollered? my hands up. We all had kids like that, right? But I'm telling you, I have nothing to be proud about, dude, except thank God for what he's allowed us to have, right? Are you proud of your husband or your wife? You better start saying thank God for the husband or the wife you've given me. You proud of your church? You need to say thank God for the church we have. Thank God for the ministry we have here. Thank God for what you, for. it's none of us, it's all of him. We couldn't do it. When we tell the story of this church, people look at me like I'm crazy, and I was, I guess. When we, when we started this church, Carolyn and I put a mortgage or got to the church and, and signed the papers in our name. There's no way we could have paid for this building. It just wasn't. We were, we were paying for our house. We didn't have any extra money. I didn't have the money to put down on the building. A guy loaned it to me. And we signed these papers, and God, since that very first day, has made every, pay, every payment on anything we've ever had in this building. Put in air conditioning after the first year, paid for. Put the fellowship hall next door, as soon as it was in, it was paid for. Had somebody leave money on the, on the desk in there one night, paid for the whole church. God did it. What do we have to be proud of? How many of you have a great job? Raise your hand. How'd you get it? Wasn't you. God blessed you with it. Every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, from whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Everything we have. So we have nothing to be proud of except our Heavenly Father. And I think He likes us to be proud of Him. All right, the men are going to come and they're going to uncover whoever's serving tonight. And I'm going to read to you while they're uncovering from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 what Paul said about the communion service. He said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup you do show the Lord's death till he come wherefore whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord but let a man examine himself so let him eat of that uh, bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself not discerning the Lord's body for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. 
And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you may not, uh, uh, that you come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Let me remind you that you do not have to be a member of our church in order to take communion. We practice what's called close communion. Uh, we ask that only those who are believers that know Christ as their Savior take communion. But we're going to take a few moments here in the, the early part of the service to examine ourselves as Paul has indicated here. And our desire is not to think about other people's sins, but think about yourself and ask the Lord to reveal to you things that maybe you need to confess so that when you take communion, there's nothing there that would bring you a problem before the Lord. And in just a moment, I'll close this time in prayer. So let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you that this little piece of bread reminds us that Jesus was a human, completely human, as well as completely God. And Lord, we don't understand that, but by faith we accept it. And we know that that human body suffered in, at the hands of wicked men in beatings and mockings and scourging. And we appreciate the sacrifice that he made. Father, we're reminded that we can give our bodies to him as a living sacrifice and live for him all the days of our lives while here on this earth. May that be our goal. In Jesus' name.
also tell us that the blood of Christ was a propitiation for our sin, not for our sin, but for the sins of the whole world, a complete sacrifice made once, never have to be repeated again for those who trust in his payment for our sin through his blood. And Lord, we thank you so much for it. The hymn writer had it right. It's still the blood that cleanses from sin. And we just praise your name that we can know sin's power has been broken over us. The penalty has been forgiven because of the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Men are going to take the cups up so if you pass them to the aisle, it might make it a little quicker. And we're going to sing, Let's Be the Tie That Binds. You folks need to learn this song one of these days. Let's stand together and sing, Let's Be the Tie That Binds. Every time I announce it, I see faces go, That's wrong. I don't remember the words to that song. <laughs> Let's be the Ha <laughs> ha! 